Well, good morning. I'm so glad that you guys have joined us here on this Sunday morning. And we're going to be continuing our series on the parables of Jesus and the short stories uh, that Jesus told in the Gospels. And we're going to jump right into this today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading out of the, uh, Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. So we're going to jump right into this here uh, this morning. It says this starting in verse 25. Large crowds uh, were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Verse 34 says this. Don't miss this. This is so good. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. How many of you guys know uh, that sometimes families uh, can be a difficult, difficult situation? You know, we love our families to death. We love our siblings, our mom and dad. But we all know that sometimes there can be tension uh, in our families. And no matter how much we love them, there can be anger. There can be hurt in our families. But we, we all know and we're all under the assumption uh, that no matter what, we're supposed to love our family. Uh, we're supposed to have their back. We're supposed to ride or die with them. We're supposed to hold on to them no matter what, no matter how angry uh, we get. I remember one time when I was younger, Um, we were in our house and something broke. I can't even remember what it was, but it was like a glass vase, something that was valuable. And it was one of those situations where nobody knew who did it. Uh, Nobody knew what happened. Nobody knew how it broke. Uh, Everybody was covering for everybody. And, And in my defense, I honestly had no idea how this thing broke. But the problem was, is that I built up a reputation in my life uh, that I accidentally broke expensive and valuable things around our house. I don't know why. I was careless when I was young. I would throw the ball around a lot when I was a kid. And it was just my reputation that I would accidentally break things sometimes. So everybody assumed that it was me. And my mom came up to me and she questioned me. And I was like, mom, I have no idea. It wasn't me. I have no idea who broke this. Um, And my sister, for whatever reason, She thought it would be funny if she were to forge my signature in my own handwriting and write a handwritten note to my mom confessing that I was the one who broke the vase. And if that doesn't scream who's guilty, I don't know who, uh, what does. Uh, But my mom came and she questioned me and I was blown away. I was like, I didn't write that note either. I didn't break it. I didn't write the note. And in that moment, I've never been more angry uh, at my sister. But we know that when we have times where we're mad at our family that I love my sister, I love my family, and we're supposed to. And I think that's what God wants us to do. But here, Jesus is explicitly telling this group of people, he says, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your brother, or your sister, if you don't hate your family, he says, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my disciple. And this is wild language. Like, this is really crazy to think about because this is not, this is not Jesus's MO, right? Like, Jesus is all about love. He's all about forgiveness and grace. He's not the type of person who's supposed to be telling people to hate one another. But here we see that Jesus says, if you don't hate these people, if you don't hate your mom and dad, you are not worthy to be my disciple. This is wild. And, and it, it seems so out of line of character of who Jesus is. So what is he saying here? What is Jesus trying to get across? And I think it's really important to look at what is happening a few verses before this. And essentially what's happening is, is that Jesus is in the company of a group of people called the Pharisees. And they are the religious leaders of the day. In a few verses before what we just read, it says that they are watching Jesus 
carefully. And what that means is that they're watching Jesus to see, does he fit inside their bubble, their group of people, or their circle? Does he fit with their ideology, with their mindset, with their own way of thinking? Because if he does, great. But if he doesn't, they're going to get rid of him. So they're watching him carefully to see, is Jesus somebody that we want to keep around? Does he fit inside of this box that I have created for myself? So I think Jesus is trying to combat that way of thinking. And he's saying that there should be nothing, no one, anything that you place at a higher priority than myself. He says, there should be nothing that you love more than me. Your loyalty should only, only, first and foremost, go to Jesus himself. So he's combating this this thought process. And I I don't think that Jesus tells us that we really should hate people. I, I really don't think that this is what Jesus is saying here. But I think he's being incredibly serious in saying that there should be nothing that you are more loyal to in your life. There should be nothing that you love more than me. Not even your own family. And I think... Jesus understands that our family members, they cannot hold the weight that God holds. They cannot carry the burden that God can carry. They cannot bring us true fulfillment in our lives. They cannot bring us true hope or grace or mercy or a light inside of our lives. We can try and we can place that on them, but Jesus understands that if we try to place them as the God of our lives, that it's only going to lead towards destruction towards them and hurt towards us because they could never live up to the expectation that we want them to live up to. And Jesus says, only I can carry that weight. Only I could take that. So he says that your love should and only be in me and that everything else should be a secondary love because if you put your first love into anything else, it's only destructive to yourself and the people in who you're putting your trust in. So verse 27 says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is telling them that all of the plans, all of the things that you love the most in your life, he's telling them that you need to lay those down, that we need to surrender those things and trust in him more than anything else. He says, take up your cross and follow the plan that I have for you, the purpose that I have for you. Everything else should be a secondary option. And this sounds harsh, right? This sounds dramatic. This is, this is, I'm sure, going to bring up a lot of tension in the group of people that he's talking to. But this brings up a lot of tension in my life, too, and I'm sure it does for you. I don't know about you, but my, my family is one of the most important things in my life. There is almost nothing that I, I would not do to make sure that I'm taking care of my wife. There's nothing that I would not do to make sure that I'm protecting my wife or providing for her or ensuring that I'm setting us up well for success in the future. I love my wife more than almost anything in the world. And here Jesus is, is telling us that if you do not love him more than your wife, more than your spouse, more than your kids even, he says you're not worthy to be a disciple of mine. Your biggest priority should be the plans, the purposes, and the person of Jesus. And this is really difficult to swallow. Like if we really think about this, this is a difficult thing to swallow, that the priorities of my kids, of my spouse, of my family members, or anything or anyone else should not be my number one priority. And Jesus, I think he recognizes this tension point. He understands that this is a difficult thing for us to grasp. And he says this in verse 28. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? He's telling us, think this through. Before you start following Jesus, before you start going after the things that he wants for your life, before you start giving your attention to him, he says, think this through. This is a big deal. This is going to cost you everything. It requires us to take up our cross, to follow him, to surrender everything at the feet of Jesus. So he says, don't take this decision lightly. Think this through. It's a big deal. So obviously, this is not the most uh, heartwarming or encouraging uh, 
topic or story that Jesus has shared or the ones that we have gone over. Uh, and Jesus recognizes this tension. And it almost feels, uh, for me at least, it feels like Jesus is almost trying to persuade us not to follow after him. He says, hey, this is probably a really bad idea. Like, don't do this because it's going to cost you a lot. It almost sounds like that that's what Jesus is saying here. And I don't know, uh, there was times in my life when, when I was younger, I didn't like roller coasters when I was young. I was terrified of them. I, was, I, I never wanted to go near any one of them, but all of my friends did. And all of my friends, in order to try to convince me to go on a roller coaster, they would give me all of these reasons, except for every reason that they shared made me want to go on the roller coaster even less. They would tell me that it goes so fast, you feel like your face is going to rip off. They would tell you that when you go over the hill, it feels like you're going to fly out of your seat. I'm like, this is, this is not helping, guys. And it seems like Jesus is like one of my friends when I was 12 years old, where he says, hey, you should follow me. It's going to be great. Oh, by the way, you're supposed to hate your mom, hate your dad. It's going to cost you everything. You're going to have to carry a Cross, it's going to be a huge burden. So you should really think about this first. What is Jesus doing here? Is he try, trying to dissuade us from following after him? And I think there's two verses right at the end that make this entire passage completely make sense and point to the reason of what Jesus is trying to do. And, and for me, when I first read this, I thought it was completely random. I, I had no idea what Jesus was talking about at first. And maybe you thought it was completely random too when he says this. But in verse 34, I'm going to read this again. It says this, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So what on earth does salt have to do with anything? What is Jesus saying here? What is he trying to tell us? And this sounds very familiar. Maybe you picked it up too, but this sounds very familiar to a passage that Jesus shares in Matthew 5, where it says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that when we surrender everything to him, the things that we love the most, and we lay them at Jesus' feet and say, Jesus, I love these things and they're important to me, but you are the ultimate authority of my life and I'm trusting in you more than anything else in my life. He says that when we do that, there is a salty nature that comes about us. Our life begins to be salty. And if you've grown up or if you've been around uh, youth culture at all or young adults at all, you know that being called salty is not a good thing. In fact, it's an insult. Uh, but Jesus means this in the highest, highest praise possible. Because back in their time, salt was incredibly valuable. Salt was used not only to give flavor to foods in ways that other things could not, but more importantly, salt was used to preserve food. They obviously didn't have refrigerators or coolers or, or ice and things like that that they could have on demand. So they would use salt to preserve, the uh, to preserve the life of their food. And this was almost like a lifeline for them. So Jesus is saying here that when you, when you neglect to surrender something to me, when you don't take up your cross and follow me, he says that you are losing the salt of your life. And then if it's lost its saltiness, it says, then, then what's the point? And he says that that salt of our life, it brings hope inside of us. It brings light. It brings grace. It brings forgiveness, not only for us, but for the world around us. And he recognizes that when we put our trust and our faith in other things, when those are the most important things to us, he recognizes that we're taking the salt out of ourselves. He, we're taking the salt out of them and we're becoming destructive to both parties that when we place the priorities of our kids more than the priorities of Jesus, when we think we're actually doing a favor for our kids, it, he says that we're actually destroying them and ourselves. We're removing the salt, the light, the hope, the grace, the truth, and forgiveness from ourselves. So Jesus says that the option, the way that we maintain that salty life is actually reversed than how we would normally think. 
It's not to pursue the things that we think are valuable, but it's to surrender them to Jesus and allow him to instill that salt into our lives. So the question for you and for me that I have to answer, that you have to answer, that we all have to think about and go through is what are the things in our hearts, in our lives, that we are placing as the ultimate authority, the ultimate loyalty, and the ultimate love above Jesus? And if you've ever tried doing those things, you know that once you try to follow after those things, whether it be success, whether it be your family, whether it be your kids, it always ends up leaving you unfulfilled, hopeless, without light, because you feel like you're never good enough. You feel like you could never reach the level that you need to to become happy or joy-filled. And Jesus recognizes that only he can bring those things that our heart, that our souls desperately need. Our families, even our kids, even our parents cannot hold the weight of God in our lives. So I know for us sometimes in this season, sometimes it's easy for us to put our trust in a political party or a political system. So when we see things that are wrong about our world, when we see things that are not right, um, sometimes we're afraid to speak about them or take action in some way because it doesn't line up with our political party. So we won't do anything. So in those moments, we're deciding that our political party is the ultimate authority of our lives. Or maybe we love our kids more than anything. We want them to succeed. We want them to do well, which is a good thing. And we should go after those things. But when we place them as ultimate authority in our lives, sometimes we forget that what they really need more than anything is the grace and the power and the truth of Jesus and who he is. So we'll place other things like sports and musicals in their lives. And we forget to have them become involved in faith-based communities where they can grow and know who Jesus has created them to be. And we mean the best, we mean the most, but ultimately we're being destructive to ourselves and to the people that we love the most. They can't carry or hold the weight of God. So what are the things that we are trusting in more than Jesus that we're striving for fulfillment fulfillment or grace in? Jesus says, surrender those at my feet. We can't take Jesus and place him in a box and say, Jesus, if you fit here, then I'll follow you. Jesus requires everything of us. But he promises that if we surrender the things we love the most, he says that salt begins to enter into our lives. There's hope in life. There's light and forgiveness inside of us. And then we have the opportunity to spread that to the same people in the things that we love the most. So the question is, what is your ultimate authority? Is it Jesus Or is it something that's going to leave in destruction and hurt and pain? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you are not just a God who asks us to surrender everything to to him without anything. But God, we are able to surrender everything to you because you had first surrendered your everything for us. You died and you rose again to give us light, to give us life, forgiveness, grace, and truth. And God, we are grateful. And God, I pray that we are a people that every day we decide to give our hope, to give our life, to give our hearts, the things that we love the most to you, trusting that you will bring the salt back into our life and into the people that we love the most around us. We praise you, Jesus, in your name.